it just seems to me that when you say the party's over and you do have something to offer them, I think you're right. A significant portion are going to say, well, you know what? That's just what I needed. That was the nudge I needed. If all of a sudden I've either got to go this route and do this the hard way or take the help I'm being offered, uh, hell, sign me up. I don't want to do this anymore, and I don't want to go the hard line. I'd rather take the help and do what I need to do to get myself back. You know, Dr. Phil, I was going to make one point, too, to that, which is that one of the points that harm reduction advocates make, which is accurate, is that most people who experiment with drugs, including hard ones, don't become addicts. And by the same token, um, a, a significant number of people that become addicts are able to quit on their own without needing to go to rehab. So that's great, and, 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 but it has to be encouraged. And so I think that when the society says this is not okay, there are gonna be consequences, we're gonna have a significant number of these folks able to resolve this on their own, and the others will be able to get the help that they need. Look, I understand that a lot of these people, as you say, because of their dysfunctional family life, they're not like going to say, well, okay, I, I guess I'll go home and spend Christmas with the family. Not going to happen for a lot of these people. And for many of them, being on the street may be their best alternative. If they come from abusive homes where there's incest and abuse and all, but the bar is really low in terms of giving them an alternative. and. I just think the alternative doesn't have to be one that's enabling. The alternative can be one that says, I'm offering you some dignity here. I'm offering you a ladder. And this isn't about blaming the victim. It's about saying, look, I'm going to give you a path back. You do this, then you do that. Then we start training and we start helping you get your resume together and we start helping you get a job. And then all of a sudden they start gaining some momentum. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's really, I think it's about humanizing the victim. It's actually treating people in the throes of addiction or mental illness as people with the potential to be full human adults. And by not this, this mantra of not holding people accountable the, the coddling and the enabling, it's an infantilization of adults who have the potential for recovery. And so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's actually treating people as full humans rather than infantilizing them. So that's what you want to see happen. It's what I want to see happen. What is most likely to happen over the next year to two years? Well, it's really a very interesting moment right now. I've been, um, unusually quiet on this issue compared to the last year and a half, because I've been trying to give the politicians a minute to sort out all that's happened. We were able to generate a significant amount of national attention to the problems in California cities. We put the governor under some significant amounts of pressure. The San Francisco mayor's under pressure. They removed the district attorney from San Francisco. There is a new district attorney. She has said that she will prosecute drug dealers, including with homicide charges, if their drugs result in overdose deaths. There's a mayor's race in L.A., and this is the top issue by far. So we are at an inflection point, and I, I think it could go either way. I mean, I, I think that, you know, these are really deep patterns of dysfunction. It's hard to get out of them. On the other hand, the public is with us on this issue. I mean, the public is very fed up. The voters don't understand why this problem isn't being solved. They're really getting tired of it. In the last Los Angeles mayor's debate, one of the journalists said that, you know, the polling that they had done and the conversations with residents is that the residents are just sick of it and they just want people off the street and they're done with the excuses and they're done with making the perfect the enemy of the good. So, you know, medium and long term, I'm optimistic. I'm not sure how soon it'll happen, but I do think we will end up doing the right thing, even if we have to exhaust all other options before then. What do you think is going to happen in the LA mayor's race? Boy, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm 
somewhat inspired. I'm a little, I, you know, there's one candidate, Rick Caruso, who has said he wants to bring everybody inside. He's said that that's actually essential as a goal. I thought that his opponent, Karen Bass, was headed in a similar direction, but she ended up lapsing back into the traditional progressive talking points that everybody needs their own apartment unit, which is just bonkers. I mean, there's 66 or so thousand homeless people in Los Angeles County. You can't just go giving apartment units to every free apartment units to every single one of them. It just literally it's there's not there's no way to do that financially or geographically or on any time horizon that matters. And of course, you do that and you create an incentive for more people to go live on the street. So I, I was I did. I thought for a minute there that both candidates were headed in the right direction. But it feels like the, the progressive one has lapsed back onto to the status quo policies that really got us to where we are now. So you think Karen Bass has gone back to the home first individual apartment living? I heard her say that in the last debate that she said, yeah, we'll have some shelter, but we have to deal with the root cause. And by the root cause, she meant rents are too high and poverty. And how that's disappointing because she's somebody who was active on these issues during the crack epidemic in the 80s. She knows full well that people don't end up on the street just because their rents are too high. She knows exactly that people end up on the street because of drug addiction. But she's under pressure from a very you know powerful group of people, very powerful set of interests. I want to maintain the system the way it's working. And that's important to remember is that there's a lot of people that make a lot of money in the current homeless housing, homeless services industry, you know, multi-billions of dollars being spent every year on this industry, and they don't want to see change. And so there is there is momentum and resources for the status quo. So you think there are a lot of property owners with existing properties as well as those that would build these multi-unit properties that have a lot to lose if that gets abandoned? You know, it's hard to say. There's a the, the biggest provider of permanent supportive housing in San Francisco has been demanding an end to the open-air drug markets. And when I pointed out to him that the customers for the drug dealers outside of his hotels that are the permanent supportive housing for homeless people, he sort of said, well, everybody drinks alcohol or does some kind of drug in San Francisco and kind of waved it away. But I, I do think that there is the possibility of winning over some of the service provider and some of the housing providers to a shelter first housing earned model. But, you know, people... People are stuck in their ways. People resist change, particularly people that are profiting from the existing system.